English writing composition students. This week we have a very important topic that pertains to our subject and I'm really excited to present it as it's one that I crafted with uh, a lot of love and attention and uh, I'm really psyched to get into this. And the topic of uh, this week's lecture is textual analysis. Ooh, textual analysis. <laughs> so without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, there's three documents that you're going to have open for this lecture, and they're all found in this week's module. Number one, you'll of course need the PowerPoint itself, entitled Textual Analysis Lecture. The second document that you'll need is this handout that accompanies it and your completion of this handout is actually how you will get credit for this lecture. So uh, as we are moving forward, uh, please make it a point to follow along as uh, this is how she'll be getting your credit. <laughs> so okay, so you need the PowerPoint, you need the handout, and you also need this one that's in this document that's entitled Textual Analysis Lecture Vocab. Uh, this is going to be some of the key terms that are going to be uh, crucial and uh, cornerstones, if you will, to our lecture. So have please have these three documents open. So without further ado, let's let's get it popping. Let's get into it. <laughs> All right, so here we have, uh, do you guys know who this is? It's the very intellectual and uh, I guess I could say mature and wise owl from Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> and he's welcoming us. So textual analysis. So first of all, uh, we start with this word which is <laughs> the whole topic of our lecture here, right? Which is text. Um, when you hear this word text, what is something that, that comes to mind? And, you know, whatever that may be, whether a text message or a mail or a book or whatever it is that you might see. So uh, do me a favor and um, go into our handout and take a moment to jot down some words here that come to mind when you hear the word text and uh, that could be you can type that out or you can also print out this handout and write it out in pen if you choose to go that route then you can simply scan it or take a picture and submit it into its respective assignment link so pause the video and uh, <laughs> jot down some words that come to mind when you hear the word text so I, when, when I was in grad school, I read this immensely helpful book uh, by Joseph Harris, and uh, the book was called Rewriting How to Do Things with Texts, How to Do Things with Texts, <laughs> plural, uh, and uh, Joseph Harris presented a, a text uh, with this definition. He said, a text is a constructed artifact that carries meaning. Hmm, interesting. A constructed artifact that carries meaning. Tell me more. <laughs> so, you ask yourself this. Uh, okay, first of all, take a look <laughs> at your handout and tell me if the things that you wrote uh, all pertain to writing somehow. Is, it, is that the case? I'm assuming it is. If that is indeed the case, then know that you're not alone, because uh, also prior to uh, encountering Joseph Harris, I, I too had this conception that a text was only something written. Um, check out what he says. This is from Harris. So, a book or other piece of writing is a text, but so are movies, plays, songs, paintings, sculptures, photographs, cartoons, videos, billboards, advertisements, web pages, and the like. Interesting, you'd be like, how so? Let's look at it again. A text is a constructed artifact 
that carries meaning. Hmm, artifact. Just what might an artifact be? Well, surprise, surprise, it's actually our first vocab key term on our document here for our vocab words. And we have uh, these key traits about artifacts to bear in mind. Artifacts can be shelved, filed, or stored, and then retrieved and re-examined. So bear that in mind. For something to be an artifact, it must be able to be shelved, filed, stored, then be able to be retrieved and re-examined. So, with that understanding, uh, you might be saying, oh, okay, Mr. Godoy, are you telling me that I can just willy-nilly be calling absolutely everything I text, like this moment? Is this moment a text, this moment that we're living now? <laughs> well, uh, not everything is a, is a text. Uh, check this out. Unlike actions, memories, or events, texts are objects that have been made and designed. Artifacts, <laughs> there's our vocab word, that can in some way be shelved, filed, or stored, and then retrieved and re-examined. This is what makes them so central to academic work. It's precisely that we can make concrete references to a text, right? If we're looking at a photograph, then we can we can very, uh, you know, intentionally look at a particular section of that photograph. If we're looking at a play, then we can absolutely re-examine um, the lines within a scene, that pertain to an act see we can we can re-examine those lines that that have been stored within the play for us um, and that's actually really important because unless an event is somehow documented by way of maybe a a, a picture that is uh, taken through a camera or uh, Perhaps it is sketched, uh, or maybe you just stop and write a poem about it. <laughs> See, then that's when you've created the text, right? The text would be, in this case, the poem that you wrote about uh, a special moment, like maybe something outrageous. Maybe you're just standing out there, and all of a sudden, a herd of elephants just passes in front of you right in the middle of the street intersection. <laughs> So unless you somehow document it to create it a, an artifact, then it can't be a text, right? Um, and what's neat about photographers is that they're very intentional with their composition, right? They work with lighting, they work with shadows, they work with lines. Uh, same thing with poets and writers, right? Their tools are, are, are words and literary devices. <laughs> So do bear that in mind um, when considering what is a text or not. And I do want to remind you, my friends, to be following along uh, here on our handouts. Okay. So, oh, by the way, do you guys know where this is from? These marching hammers. They're from Pink Floyd's The Wall, which is a really rad text. It's so far out, and it's very much uh, an allegory of Nazi Germany, uh, as well as a uh, platform to host the larger theme of isolation. So uh, this is a very poignant text, The Wall. If you haven't watched it, then check it out. So how do we perform the work of analysis? Now, now that we've actually uh, presented what a text is and have a better understanding of it, when, when we say textual analysis, which is the whole topic of this lecture, what is it that we are seeking to do? Well, uh, what analysis does is that it deconstructs a composite into its components. And you know, uh, if you haven't noticed here on our worksheet, <laughs> We have the smiling dog here. 
for any new vocab words that you might encounter throughout this lecture. So you can jot them down uh, as well as their definition if I do mention them, uh, or maybe if I don't mention the vocab words, then you can jot them down to look them up later, okay? So, uh, okay, so let's return to analysis. So in an analysis, what it does is that it deconstructs a composite into its components. And simply put, a composite is just a holistic, complete thing made up of smaller parts, such as is the case of this Mario Lego figure here. <laughs> this Mario figure is a holistic, complete Mario figure, but it is made of individual Lego blocks, right? And that is what a component is. So if we shift gears back into the text, into, into our conception of text, if, the, if, this, if these are the moves that we make, then how, Mr. Godoy, do we do this? Do we, how do we deconstruct a composite into components when talking about texts? Well, we move from what's known as denotation to connotation. It's very much a dynamic move. Uh, and whether or not you vaguely remember these words, uh, or maybe you've never heard them at all, uh, this, is what, this is how we do it. And denotation, simply put, is just the surface level meaning of something. So it's just what we see at the surface without any further digging for anything beyond that, anything deeper, any golden nuggets. It's just what we see at the surface. Uh, when thinking about, say, like a word, its denotation would be its literal dictionary meaning. So for example, uh, here we have the word snake. And the meaning of a snake, its dictionary meaning, its denotation, its surface level meaning, is just a limbless scaled reptile with a long tapering body. But as you can see, that's just at the surface. If you look at our picture here, it's just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> now, let's let's revisit the snake as we move next into connotation. So if denotation is surface level meaning, then connotation is actually deeper level meaning and it's what we are aiming to do when we are moving uh, by way of textual analysis when we are analyzing a text we're moving to seek out its connotation because that my friend is where we will dig up the golden nugget <laughs> the things beyond the surface now if we return to our good example uh, here our good friend the snake <laughs> We saw its dictionary meaning. We saw its denotation. Now, the snake has cultural meanings for us, right? What if I call you, you snake? What does it mean to be called a snake? Am I calling you a limbless, scaled reptile with a long tapering body? What about the phrase, once a snake, always a snake. What are we implying here? So, you see where I'm getting here. Um, when, when we look at connotation, it considers things like social cultural overtones. It considers things like emotional meanings. It considers implications. And the implication of something is simply it's so what question. Why does it matter? What is its significance? And in this case, we might add, okay, well, what is at stake? Who benefits? Who is diminished? So what? <laughs> so the, these, these um, key questions, these key considerations of what connotation does will be very beneficial as we move forward uh, through this lecture and 
our tasks are found within our handouts. <laughs> so I like I like how we were talking about the meaning of a snake. Like for us, which by the way, what 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 does it mean to be called a snake? When you're a snake, you're somebody who cannot be trusted. You're somebody who will cheat you the very first chance that they get, right? Hopefully, you don't have any friends or anybody in your social circle who are snakes. Because if you do, I would advise that you get them out of your life. <laughs> you know, uh, another good example of a symbol is the dragon, right? Here in the West, the denotation of a dragon, we we all know what a dragon looks like. You know what I, you know what I instantly think of when when I think of a dragon, I think of the uh, Dragon Ball Z dragon. <laughs> this guy, I think he's called Shen Shenron Shenron, right? Did you guys ever watch Dragon Ball Z? <laughs> what was his name? Was it was he Shenron? I think it was Shenron. Sorry, I went off on a little tangent here. Shenron Dragon Ball. Yep, I got it. Shenron. So I, I always think of Shenron from Dragon Ball. <laughs> so any in any case, um, so just the surface level um, vision of what a dragon is, that, that image that you have, that's the denotation, right? That's surface level meaning. But if we look at, at, its, at its connotation, um, we, we look at social cultural overtones you know what what it what it signifies for uh, a culture let's say here in the west what does a dragon signify does does a dragon have a positive meaning does it have a positive connotation in the west no absolutely not you know we we often see stories about knights vanquishing dragons right they're they're always the villain they're the antagonist also uh, if we can look at the dragon as seen in the bible as representing satan right so absolutely here in the west the dragon does not have a positive connotation now let's flip the script let's flip it to the east the the dragon actually has a much different connotation in the east it uh represents good fortune right um and and it has a far more positive connotations which is why we see the dragon uh, when we go to say like chinese restaurants or even in um, in festivals for chinese new year i don't know if you guys have seen but um they they're um, in the in the festivals, they they parade dressed as dra uh, in, in in dragon costumes. So it means something entirely different. It connotes something different. So yeah, here's what we said. Here's the snake again. <laughs> snake, someone who can't be trusted or ch cheats. Um, and that, my friends, actually pertains to what we're talking about because that's what it, that's what snake means for us here within this Western context, right? That's what I'm trying to get you to see. <laughs> is that symbols or a text, whether mm, maybe that is like a, an image of a, a mural or something or uh, a symbol of something, uh, then it can represent something entirely, it can connote something entirely different for another place in the world right now i actually have a very cool historical example that uh, corresponds to this to, to this deconstructing texts and we're going to look at a couple of historical examples and what we're going to look at is propaganda and if you look here in our vocab words uh, propaganda is simply as it's a form of art created with the purpose of either glorifying or vilifying a figure or idea, figure slash idea. So this word, 
glorify. What is the root word of glorify? Glory, right? What does it mean to bring uh, someone or something glory? It's to celebrate it, right? What about the second word? Vilify. Vile, right? That's the root word, vile, or to be presented as a villain. A villain is always vile and despicable. So why propaganda works so well is because it creates this binary. It always either glorifies a figure or it vilifies it. And the way that propaganda is presented, it, it does so by always dehumanizing the figure that is vilified, right? If something can be made into a monster or not human, then it's a lot easier to hate, isn't it? Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a good example. Uh, during World War II, uh, the Nazis actually ran these propaganda films uh, where they were presenting the the these swarms of rats, rats, and uh, they were calling the, the Jews that, right? So, you see, to be called a rat is to dehumanize. So, propaganda is powerful, and it can be used constructively or destructively. And always, you, what you have to remember is that based on who creates the propaganda, based on whose perspective the propaganda is forwarding, then of course that, that subject will of course glorify the values and figures that they see fit and worthy of deserving to be glorified, right? And the same thing goes, they'll, they'll vilify uh, the figures that uh, really are, I guess you can call an antagonist for them at that moment. Which, if you see here, see, it considers uh, who benefits, who is diminished. In other words, who is glorified or what is who or what is glorified. And that's another thing. When, when we look at propaganda, characters always represent ideas and values too right so with 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 that in mind i with that in mind of you considering that propaganda is uh created um and it glorifies and vilifies and creates this binary right um and the way that it does this, too, um, before actually proceeding into our example, uh, I want to uh, further uh, flesh this out. The way that propaganda does this is through what is called rhetoric. And rhetoric, uh, simply put, is the art of persuasion in speech or text. So glorifying and vilifying and creating this binary is rhetoric, right? It's moving to persuade us to see... Uh, a, a certain perspective, right? <laughs> and by the way, what we're about to do, uh, this field, this study of signs and symbols, in this case, we're going to look at some posters. Uh, that's the work of semiotics. So my friends, let's move forward as semioticians. You ready? Let's go. <laughs> so let's return. So here's the, here's the historical example, and here is the context that I want to provide you with. And our historical example comes from World War II. Now, of course, World War II spanned from 1939 to 1945, but the United States did not become involved until 1941, right? Now, during World War II, um, the United States joined and took part in what was known as the Grand Alliance, and that lasted throughout 
our involvement in the World War II, right, which was from 1941 to 45, or at least um, the Grand Alliance and our and the U.S. involvement, right, in World War II. And of course, uh, this Grand Alliance that we formed was uh, set to contend against the Axis powers. Do you guys know who made up the Axis powers in World War II? Germany, Italy, and Japan. So th this Grand Alliance consisted of the United States, the United Kingdom, and the then Soviet Union. And here in this image on the bottom left, you can see the leaders of these great nation states, right? Uh, for the Soviet Union, we have Joseph Stalin, who is the then leader. Uh, for the United States, we have Franklin D. Roosevelt here in the center. And for the United Kingdom, we have Winston Churchill. So bear this in mind, okay? At this moment, these are our allies during this Grand Alliance. And I want you to pay attention to this one, to the Soviet Union. They were our allies during this time, during World War II. So, of course, the propaganda is going to reflect a positive a positive understanding of this figure of the soviet union right take a look at this next poster and that's actually going to be part of your next tax task here go to your go to this uh, go back to your handout and we're going to look at this one this says this man is your friend poster and as you look at this ask yourself okay is this figure being glorified or vilified, and how do you know? Now, on the left-hand side, you're going to either type or write some denotative features that you notice from this poster. Remember that denotation is simply surface-level meaning. That is, details without any further digging or recognition of deeper meaning. It's just what we see at the surface. So take a look at this first propaganda poster. This is an actual uh, poster during this period of the Grand Alliance that the United States had with the Soviet Union. So this is a poster um, that we would have seen here in the U.S. and the United States during this period. Check it out. This man is your friend. He's a Russian soldier. He fights for freedom. So uh, on this left-hand side, you are going to write details that you notice and don't don't uh, deconstruct anything yet don't deconstruct any deeper meaning yet for example uh, a denotative detail could be this blue banner right the fact that friend is in all capital all caps right what do you see about the image what do you see about his face his expression what what do you see here and for each of those details that you see on this denotation side, I want you to find its corresponding connotation, its corresponding implication. So for example, here, I'll give you this one. So if you chose the fact that the word friend is in all caps, then what is that suggesting? What is that indirectly suggesting? Well, in this case, <laughs> directly suggesting, right? <gasps> well, truly that uh, the Soviet soldier is our friend, right? And this sentiment is being reflected here through this poster. So I want you to do that for each of the, of the uh, denotative details that you see. Try to get as many as you can. <laughs> now, yes, so that's the current sentiment during the Grand Alliance toward the Soviets. Now, check this out. <laughs> Shortly after the breakdown of the Grand Alliance, <laughs> just two years after, is it, if you'll recall, Grand Alliance was from 1941 to 1945. <laughs> so literally two years after, in 1947, the United States entered the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Now, it was cold because rather than having a direct combat it was cold 
because it was it was more so like <clears throat> both superpowers try to like flex their biceps who was the strongest <clears throat> who was who was the i guess i guess we yeah who was the best and this is certainly uh, i would say really fueled by hubris and pride so the way these two superpowers had this cold war um, they did they did that through the arms race which was their development of war material and armaments they did that through the space race as well who can send a man to space first <laughs> you know what's funny is that uh so here in the united states we um we called the men that we would send to space astronauts right astros the astros um uh, the stars do you know what the soviets called theirs cosmonauts and if i'm not mistaken uh, cosmo is the whole universe. Let me see. Cosmo, ooh, cosmo meaning, cosmo meaning. <laughs> exactly. It's from here's from Russia. Cosmo. <laughs> so, <laughs> isn't that funny that even in the name itself? Um, so, by the way, I didn't look up Astros for you. Astros meaning. <laughs> oh, eighth wonder. Nope. Here we go. Let's look at the dictionary meaning uh, pertaining to stars or celestial bodies. Okay, stars, celestial bodies. <laughs> but <laughs> the Soviets moved to one up us even in what they called theirs cosmonauts. <laughs> it's the whole universe cosmos. <laughs> so, okay. Um, they did that through, yeah, through the space race. Who could send uh, someone to space first? Um, you know, I think, I think it was. I think I think in this one the the Soviets won it wasn't it Yuri it starts with the first name was like Yuri right uh, who made it to space first yep Yuri Gagarin I was I got it okay so 1961 so the the Soviets won the space race here uh, oh not Alan Shepard <laughs> see because he was the second man but um, this here what was it Yuri Gaga Gagarin there we go hope I'm saying it right. <laughs> So they won the space race. There's their cosmonaut. I'm going to try to say it. Yuri Alekseyevich Gagarin, 1961. Was able to uh, orbit Earth, <laughs> thus becoming the first man to go into space. So uh, I was mentioning that because, okay, so uh, they were having this Cold War by who can develop the biggest arms, the mightiest missiles, the mightiest war armaments, who can get to space first. And another one, too, is through proxy wars. A proxy war really hits close to home. Um, first of all, let's talk about what a proxy war was. So here we have these two superpowers. I want you to kind of imagine two puppeteers, right? And these two superpowers, what, what, what they would do is that they would, they, would, they would get involved in other nations across the world um, that were feuding. And according to which faction aligned with the ideology of each given superpower and their values, right? then that's who they would fund, right? They would fund, offer war material, and training. Now, here's why this hits close to home. So, uh, I was born in 1987 in San Salvador, El Salvador, which is a small Central American country. And we had a proxy war, we had a civil war, where the national government... Um, was fighting against the guerrilla soldiers, right? They called them guerrilleros. And because the national army uh, aligned more with the values of the United States than the United States offered funding, training, and war material, right? And because the guerrilla soldiers, who were of a more communist slant, aligned more with the Soviet's ideology, 
then the Soviets provided the same thing. Funding, war material, and training. And that, my friend, was a pox proxy war. And, and I was born in the middle of one, right? That's the reason that uh, my parents emigrated. And we came here to the United States, so it really hits close to home. And, it, and it's a sad thing because this happened uh, all around the world where uh, the Soviets and the U.S. would get involved and have these proxy wars. And I would say very much fueled by hubris and pride. <laughs> it's like who could flex the biggest bicep. And actually, I love this cartoon here. Here we have Mikhail Gorbachev and John F. Kennedy, who were the... So here we have Gorbachev, who was the leader of the then USSR, right? The Soviet Union. And uh, John F. Kennedy, the American leader. <laughs> and I love this picture. I, I'm going to try to see if I can zoom into it a little bit more. There we go. It's funny how uh, being able to get out of full screen is letting me zoom in. So check out this, this political cartoon here, and it's representing the Cold War. So here we have... Uh, both Gorbachev and JFK sitting on missiles. And, uh, oh, and look, there was also the, the Cuban Missile Crisis during this time, which um, the the USSR had, um, we we essentially had middles, missiles pointed at one another, and, um, and it's like, okay, who's going to press it first? And, and that was why it was a tense time. Um, and if I remember correctly, um, that's why that's why they would do these um, these like what's it called these preparations in case there was um, bombing. So it's, it was a tense time be because of that. Um, but but I love that I love that they're doing an arm wrestle. They're arm wrestling, um, and there, that's the Cold War for you. So. Why this all matters to our lecture of uh, textual analysis, and we're looking at propaganda right now. So I want you to recognize that if before the Soviets were our allies during World War II and the Grand Alliance, <laughs> only two years after its the wars and <laughs> we entered the Cold War, and now they are our enemies, right? So of course the sentiment does a complete 180, and the propaganda poster reflects that. This is something, uh, this is a real propaganda poster during the Cold War. And uh, I want you to do the same thing with this poster. And I want you to go here and ask yourself again, is this figure being glorified or vilified? How do you know? And I want you to do the same thing for each surface level detail that you notice from this. And that's as much in the text as the picture itself. I want you to consider the corresponding connotation, its implications, right? What that indirectly suggests, social cultural overtones. But 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 this is the main one. Um, oh, that was pointing here. Sorry, I was here. <laughs> this is the main thing. Uh, you want to ask yourself: <clears throat> Is the figure being glorified or vilified? How do you know? How is rhetoric working here? How is this piece of propaganda working here? <clears throat> so pause the video. Take a moment to do that. Okay, so after you do that, now I have one last example of how textual analysis works. Ah, by the way, I don't know if you just realized it, but you actually just became semi auditions you just analyzed the text of this propaganda poster. You did it. <laughs> How does it feel? <clears throat> so another place where we're going to see uh, analysis, we're going to have an opportunity to work our semiotician magic <laughs> is through satire. Uh, satire is a work that ridicules its subject through the use of techniques such as exaggeration, reversal, incongruity, and or parody in order to make a comment or criticism about it. Uh, exaggeration we know as 
offering very extreme traits to something, right? Like, if I say, like, okay, like, if I haven't seen you, like, like, literally, like, if you haven't seen your friend in a really, really long time, if you, when you say, I haven't seen you in a million years, you know, that's an exaggeration to indicate a long time, right? Reversal, okay. Um, with reversal, it's, it's when the role of a figure is completely re reversed. Like, for example, what if we were to see like a, like a sketch maybe on Saturday Night Live? Um, maybe representing, you know, someone who was very cruel, like Genghis Khan. <laughs> and representing him as kind and generous. That would be reversal. And actually, that goes hand in hand with incongruity. In geometry, two congruent figures are the same, right? In, in terms of um, their uh, degrees, right? Like, like, look, let me let me show you. Congruent. Let's look at congruent triangles. See, these triangles are congruent. Of course, the scale could be different, but they're the same, right? Um, when when we talk about something being congruous, it's it's going to match. In this case, with 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 an expectation of something, right? Um, this prefix in um, annuls the meaning of the root word, right? So to be incongruous means to not to be congruous, right? To, in this case, to to not match an expectation, right? If, if I were to tell you this, you guys are not going to believe it. So there I was driving my car and boom, my tires just blew out. Oh, that was the best thing ever. Because then I got out and as I got out, somebody pulled over and mugged me. Yes, how beautiful that was. Now, what is incongruous there? What is incongruous is the fact that I'm sharing with you a, a very uh, blatantly negative the men, negative meaning, right? This is not a good thing. Nobody wants a tire blowout in the freeway. Nobody wants to get mugged. But my tone, my tone is happy. My tone is jubilant. You see how it's incongruous? My tone is not matching with the actual content of what I'm saying. Parody is imitation, and uh, improv comedy does it a lot, <laughs> as well as uh, other comedy shows like The Simpsons, right? <laughs> the Simpsons have done a lot of parody for Shakespeare and Edgar Allan Poe. South Park does it a lot too. So this is important, that satire's purpose is to make a comment or criticism uh, about a subject, about usually about something that's happening. I really like satire and I think it's immensely important because oftentimes there are these very big elephants in the room where something is clearly happening, no one's really talking about it, but satire comedy has this really awesome way of cleverly getting it out there and is able to start a dialogue a lot of times. I have a good example. So my friend, I'm not sorry, not my friend. <laughs> well, he, he, he was nice. <laughs> but a, a student in, in my class uh, worked at Amazon, right? Um, at, at the warehouse. And uh, he was telling me how the South Park episode, <laughs> the Amazon um, really, really captured and made a comment on uh, what the conditions are like working in, in the Amazon factory, you know, uh, so methodically having to enter and, and, you know, no, no windows anywhere. And he said, you know what, Mr. Godoy, that's exactly how it is. So I'm mentioning that because that episode really makes an important comment or criticism about the uh, poor conditions, uh, uh, for the, uh, the, the, the Amazon um, warehouses in a lot of places. So, so what we're going to do 
is that we're going to look at an article. We're going to look at a satirical article from this satirical publication called The Onion. If you haven't heard about it, now you have. <laughs> Before we look at it, I want to give oops, I want to give you a little bit of context um, as to what it's actually commenting on. Um, so, before doing that, um, I want to make it clear what what a for profit college is. For profit college. So, uh, for profit college. Here, let's take a look at this. For pro, uh, da, 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 da. There we go. Check this out. Though there may be diff uh, other differences, the main difference between a for-profit and non-for-profit college is that non-profits are owned by an individual group of shareholders, and any profits or any any profits made by a non-profit school organization must be reinvested back into or held by the organization itself. This difference in who owns the school does have an effect on who's making decisions as well as their underlying motivation. So if a school is run as a business and not as an institution of education with educators and students in mind, that become that can become problematic. Um, so what was happening with uh, a few years back with um, there was a lawsuit against uh, for-profit institutions um, because students were entering these for um, for-profit institutions. Like let me let me give you some examples for-profit <laughs> for-profit colleges. Let me give you some examples. Oh look, there's some around here. Um, so. Arizona, uh, University of Arizona, American Career College. Oh, I had no idea that LA College of Music was one. Um, DeVry, that's another one. Um, look at this. And the now defunct ITT Tech. University of Phoenix, that's another one. So what was happening is that these students were getting into these programs. They were borrowing and borrowing. And um, I know that that happened with DeVry Institute, that here were these people with these debt. When all of a sudden DeVry just closed, <laughs> it completely closed. And here were these students stuck with these debts. And um, look at this. The graduate, the overall graduation rate at for-profit institutions is just 27%, which is really low uh, compared to non-profit institutions. So th this is a little bit of context of, of what was happening um, that, that really uh, created an exigency in the writers of this article to create it. <laughs> so with that in mind, I, I want you to pull up the article um, here it's it's actually in in our module um, I'm gonna search it uh, I think it was mm, there we go okay so if, if you look at our module um, I'm also going to in, embed it in there so this is it it's called online university allows students to amass crippling debt at own pace okay so as I'm reading this and as you're looking at the picture, I want you to, and that and that's what this is going to be here. Um, I want you to be considering how these these things are uh, making an appearance, right? How are you seeing exaggeration? How are you seeing reversal? How are you seeing incongruity? Are you seeing parody at all? <laughs> so bear that in mind. Um, and yeah, as you're looking at this, uh, try to answer, okay, well, what is this article commenting on? What is it critiquing? What, what is the subject, right? What is the article's tone? So the, the tone of something is just how something is presented. Remember with my example when I was like, oh, guys, I, I got this flat and then I was mugged. Like, that's a happy tone. That's a jubilant tone. <laughs> which by the way is incongruous in this case <laughs> so it's how how is the article presenting the information right 
Uh, and what I'm trying to get you to, to see is how does the author really feel about this topic? That That's their position, right? The, the, the thing with satire is that because it works with these uh, methods, like it uses exaggeration, reversal, and incongruity and parody, it requires you to perform an analysis, a textual analysis, right? <laughs> Which is what we're going to do here to, to really uncover how, how, does the, how does the author really feel about this topic? <laughs> All right, so that, that's our task. And um, I'm going to read this, and, uh, and I want you to reread it too. And you're going to do the same thing. You're going to have surface level, everything from words to phrases, to sentences, <laughs> to what you see visually, like in the picture. And you're going to do the same. You're going to consider the corresponding connotations of that. What is that indirectly suggesting? Um, are you seeing, <laughs> how are you seeing things like uh, maybe reversal or incongruity? There's a lot of incongruity in this article, by the way. <laughs> and like, what's it really suggesting? What's it really indirectly suggesting? That's what you're going to do here for each corresponding thing, just like you did with the propaganda posters. <laughs> so check this out. I look forward to reading this to you. Okay. Online university allows students to amass crippling debt at own pace. Enterprise College. A crew paralyzing debt on your own schedule. Explore your possibilities. Enterprise College helps prepare you for the professional path you want through flexible learning. Every degree program is 100% online, all the time, on your tablet, laptop, and even your smartphone. Career-focused education. Our associates, Bachelor's and master's degree programs are developed in collaboration with industry leaders from the companies that offer the kind of jobs you want. Instructors with on-the-job experience. Our professors are skilled educators and industry professionals who teach real-world knowledge. Student support. We have an online community of advisors, faculty, and fellow students to share your experiences and offer support when you need it. Risk-free trial. You can enroll and take the first three weeks of an introductory credit-bearing course with no financial obligation. Check this out. This first word, by the way, touting. What does it mean to tout? Uh, to tout something is uh, we, we accentuate the positive attributes of something so as to promote it. So if you're selling something, then of course you're if like if you're trying to sell a car, then of course you'll promote all the features, right? That's what it means to tout. Okay, you're you're promoting it. So, okay, let's 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 get into it. Touting its wide range of financially ruinous academic programs that can be tailored to meet anyone's scheduling needs, officials at Enterprise College announced Monday that the online institution is committed to letting students amass a crippling amount of debt at their own individual place at their own individual pace. Even if you work full-time and are busy raising a family, Enterprise College's flexible courses make it easy to get back to school and take out enough student loans to completely devastate your personal finances for years to come, said spokesperson Carrie Williams, describing how the, how the for-profit college accommodates those who prefer to rack up their overwhelming debt a few thousand dollars at a time, as well as those who would rather just plunge 30000 into the red in two short years. At Enterprise College, you can take as long as you need to acquire your impossible-to-shoulder burden. And with more than 180 degrees offered completely online, it's easier than ever to slip into complete destitution from the comfort of your own home. Williams went on to state that regardless of the rate at which students accumulate debt, the sooner they enroll, the sooner they can begin defaulting on their loans and having their wages garnished by the government. <laughs> what do you think of this? Uh, another thing that I forgot to mention, uh, which was part of the lawsuits too, is that these for-profit schools were really promising um, like just how much um, weight their degrees would actually hold when you went into the the job market right 
um, but a lot of times it wasn't carrying that that same weight um, so yeah <laughs> as well as this like the the students were were borrowing and borrowing and getting in debt and um you know with only what was it it was a 27 percent graduation rate which is immensely low actually let me let me confirm that here let me go back to this i think it was 27 which is immensely low oh come on <laughs> why is it sometimes when you want it to click it won't um, oh do you guys know i think there's a shortcut it's what is it command c i think that might copy it oh come on man i really want to confirm this <laughs> all right copy hey i got it <laughs> i guess the trick was to not click the text directly <laughs> i'm glad i got it though Oh, here we go. Yeah, so it was that 27%. Come on, my internet. Okay, yep, I, w I got it. Graduation rate, overall graduation rate at for profit is just 27%. That's really low. So with, and you can check this out a little bit more info if you wanna know what for profit colleges are. So I want you to do the same exact thing. <laughs> that you've been doing um, in terms of denotation and got connotation for the actual article here. And this is new vocab words to look up um, in case you did hear some new vocab words. Um, so that is that. And yeah, so you're just going to submit the handout into its respective assignment link. And that's how you'll be getting credit. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this lecture on textual analysis and I'm proud of you. You've now done it. You've done the thing. You've done semiotic work. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a good week.